Tenakota Tefano O Auckland Unitarians. Tenakota Na Manahiri. No my higher my higher my kitene fare karakia ate atua tenakoto tenakoto tenatato katoa. Welcome to this circle of community. Welcome here whether you have come with a heart full of a heart full or a heart empty, with spirits high or low, rested or tired, hopeful or despairing. Welcome here whether you come out of habit, conviction, loneliness, or you belong here because you are here. And all that you have and all that you are is welcome. This morning, we are together, the heartbeat of this congregation. For the gift of this day and for our community of spiritual nurture and compassion, we give thanks. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. May our many sparks meet and merge in communion with heart and soul. Please join me in the words of our covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. Christ for truth is a sacrament. Service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace. To seek knowledge and freedom to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each other and with our God. Please stand if you're able to sing Spirit of Life. For my reading, Burdens of Freedom by Lawrence Mead. Our politicians love to say we live in a free country. In a sense, they are correct. And we enjoy the rule of law and civil liberties. Our government is elected and the authorities cannot arrest citizens on account of their opinions. While the government enforces certain laws and levies, taxes, it remains true that we are indeed freer than most people in the rest of the world. This common view presents freedom entirely in negative terms, as a lack of outside constraints. When we casually say it's a free country, we mean that citizens can do or be anything they want, that no artificial hindrances will stand in the way of their pursuits. To be free is to be surrounded, so to speak, by empty space, which permits the free person to move in any direction they choose. But this sort of language overlooks the many obligations that freedom demands. The constraint is not only that each free person must respect the freedom of others, to say that still assumes a negative idea of freedom. Rather, excuse me. Rather, it is the, that freedom directly produces obligations. Freedom is not negative, but something positive, a set of responsibilities. The burdens of freedom are inseparable from freedom itself. Most immediately, even a free government must make the demands upon law abidingness and taxes just mentioned. But other burdens follow from the nature of a free society and even from living a free life. 
not freedom, but the burdens of freedom, which impinge upon us at many levels, are the real center of our life. Despite living in a free country, most do not experience life as free at all. Instead, life is a constant struggle to satisfy mundane demands, some of them coming from government, but some of, from other people, and others from one's own goals. Freedom is precious, not because it liberates us from constraint, but because it enlists citizens in worthwhile efforts toward life's central purpose. In every arena of life, institutions work to transmute freedom into responsibility. And that is exactly what a meaningful life requires. I've struggled for a long time with how to build a beloved community with a bunch of strong-willed individualists. <laughs> I share UU Minister Cheryl Walker's, I shared UU Minister Cheryl Walker's story a few years back to exemplify the problem. She wrote, Sunday morning, my family and I are on our way to worship services. We walk the streets of Harlem, my brother and father in dark suits with bow ties. My sister, my mother, and I dress in white. The sea of people parts to let us pass. We are strong and confident and vulnerable. It is the early 60s, and we are on our way to Mohammed's Mosque number seven. We will meet others like us and greet each other with the familiar hand grasp, kiss, and blessings of assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. We are powerful. Our power comes from our collectiveness because we act as one. We're able to build schools, publish newspapers, and start businesses. We have an unshakable sense of who we are, proud black women and men, which shields us from the racism that is pervasive in all other parts of our lives. We are not inculcated with a sense of inferiority, just the opposite. We have an unwavering sense of innate superiority. Our differences our difference feels like a badge of honor, not one of shame. Yet a shadow side exists. We are strong only if we are willing to conform. The rules are strict, and there is no tolerance for breaking them. The price to pay for the power of this type of community is the loss of individuality. For some, me included, the price became too high, and so in my teenage years, I made the choice to separate from the community. Not from the faith, but from the community. For I still love many things about the faith of my childhood. I kept my faith, but lost my religion. She went on to tell her story of finding Unitarianism. After years of wandering in a religious wilderness, a friend invited her to a Unitarian church where there was a black woman in the pulpit and banners with the symbols of the world's faith hanging on the sanctuary walls, including one with a star and crescent. It was love at first sight. In her words, I fell in love with being an individual in a faith community. I was like a kid in a candy store. Me, 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 my faith, my journey, my religion. It's about me. This religion was created with me and mine, just waiting for the day I would show up and make it complete. However, with time, she discovered the shadow side of being Unitarian. There was no discipline of faith. It required little of me. 
All I had to do was sign a book and give some money and voila, I was a Unitarian Universalist. This group of people had no cohesion beyond a single congregation and even within congregations there was little or no cohesion. Everyone had come thinking this religion was made just for them, even those people who had grown up in this faith. Therefore, everyone thought everything should be for them. This wasn't individuality. It was individualism, worship of the individual. Individualism is a core value of Unitarian Universalism, especially so in America. Church historian Conrad Wright credits both Thomas Jefferson and Ralph Waldo Emerson as exemplars of the extreme individualism that has been a hallmark of liberal religion and as privatized so that their views can yield no rationale for religious fellowship in general or the church in particular. In a 1993 sermon on individualism, the Reverend John Papandreou suggests that as an ethic, individualism ultimately fails us with worrisome theological implications. There is a vast underworld of people who have lived with the fantasy of the Lone Ranger and found it to be hell. For hell is the absence of relationship, the ultimate disconnection. This is ironic that the, that the roots of the word religion imply the ligaments that connect tissue to the body. The word reconveys reconnection and binding. In the case of most religions, religion connects or binds humanity to the supernatural, transcendent of, or spiritual spheres in spite of our need for connection. Religion has failed to evolve to meet the needs of many for connection. There is little interest in this boomer and many Gen Xers and millennials and not at all in Gen, Gen Zs to be connected to a God in heaven. For them, such a divine being and is non-existent in a place that is not there. That does not mean they are oblivious to the very human need for a different kind of religion. French paleontologist and Catholic thinker, Tillard de Chardin, personal note, he's my favorite of Catholic theologians, suggested as long ago as 1931 that the problem lies with religion's failure to accept evolution. In his mind, there is a human hesitation and resistance to open our hearts to the call of the world within us, to feel a sense of the earth. Part of this hesitation is the ambiguity of the world itself. Is the world worth our attention? Is it a place of tempor temporality and sin or a place of infinite goodness. Christianity in particular has done a tremendous disservice to the nobility of the earth by holding to a doctrine of original sin that is incompatible with evolution, creating an illusion of a fallen universe. In response to Yann de Chardin, expresses deep concern for building the earth and for developing the spirit of what earth? That is, with seeing the whole world and all its peoples within it as one. Tillyard 
was also aware that a unified Earth will not arise if religion does not undergo a radical transformation of new ideas, acquire new metaphors, and tell a new story that can harness the spirit of the Earth. In his view, religion belongs to evolution in the same way that consciousness belongs to matter. They cannot be separated. The integral relationship between religion and evolution reflects Tillyard's positive view of science as being closely aligned with religion. Tillyard saw a religious character in the work of science. Science does not, science not only does not oppose religion, but in some sense it is a necessary preparation for religion because it explores the hidden depths of reality. In this respect, neither science nor religion can develop normally without the other. Or as Tillyard writes, science cannot go to its limits without becoming tinged of mysticism and charged with faith. The kind of religion we seek today, Tillyard believes, cannot be found in the religious traditions of the past linked to static categories. What is needed is a new religion that can utilize all the free energy of the church of the earth to build humankind into greater unity. He thought that religion was too focused on the individual and an otherworldly heaven. This is insufficient, he states. People are looking for a religion of humanity and of the earth that can give meaning to human achievements, a religion that will enkindle cosmic and human evolution, and a deep sense of commitment to the earth. God has become too small to energize us for a new life. Science tells us that the universe is constantly <coughs> evolving and this fact alone must lead to the profound modification of the whole structure, not only of our thought, but of our beliefs. Tillyard's new definition of religion is a religion of the earth that can build the earth into a greater unity. Unitarian Universalism is particularly well positioned because of its history to lead the way into Tillyard's vision of what religion could be. But we will need to first adopt a new core value where community trumps individualism. Fortunately, millennials and Gen Zs have already adopted the importance of community. And as I mentioned last week, seventh generation thinking. My hope is that they can lead the rest of us to the promised land. This conversation is to be continued as we examine how that is already happening. Stay tuned.
Let us stand to sing our closing hymn. Please join me in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, and not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. For my closing words. Our time in this place may have ended, but our connection to each other and this community remains. Together, may we walk the path of justice, speak words of love, live the selfless deed, trod gently upon the earth, and fill the world with compassion until we meet again. Blessed be.